Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry, and you're listening to Trek FM. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Stage 9, Trek FM show about the people who make Star Trek. I'm Mike, and today I'm joined by Adam of Saturday Morning Trek. Or is it Treks? Saturday Morning Trek, hello, glad to be back. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. We are, we are coming to you, not live, but from Vegas, STLV. And uh, yeah, there was a, a decent amount of... Um, you know, creator-based stuff going on since it was the 50th. Not as much as I would have hoped, but what can Agreed. you do? Yeah. So we're just going to kind of give give the rundown on, on that stuff before we get into our feature, which will be John talking to Lee about optional canon. Should be interesting. All right. So, uh, yeah, what did you see there? What, what did you see at this at this convention? It's been five days. It's at the end. We were all about to pass out. In fact, the other day I was at a panel, and the panel ended, and I was leaving the panel, and you were in the back row, passed out, and I went to lunch, and I came back like an hour and a half later, and you were still in the back row, passed out. And I was like, yep, that pretty much sums up the con. That's the vibe for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's catching a mid panel nap is actually pretty sweet if you can pull it off in those horribly uncomfortable chairs but um you know it's been great um it's been a lot of fun seeing all the different panels you got a mix of programming in a larger theater uh the leonard nemo memorial theater and the smaller deforest kelly theater and uh it's a really fun mix in the larger theater i did see the deep space nine cast reunions attended by ira stephen bear as well as well as uh some voyager the Women in Trek uh, panel with Kate Mulgrew and B. Joe Trimble, really good in the big theater there. And uh, Five Year Mission, of course, the house band, absolutely uh, rocking the house this year. They would do songs playing on and off the guests, but then yesterday, because Carl Urban had to unfortunately cancel his appearance due to his commitment to the Thor Ragnarok filming, uh, the band got to play a good half hour set, which was really, really fun. Yeah, I, I'm really sorry that I missed the, the five-year mission thing. I, you know, I was kind of thinking that the five-year mission thing, I think a lot of people were, it was like, oh, 5.30 to be announced. What's this? What's this? You know, and I was 100% convinced that it was going to be something about disco. And then, you know, I was talking to Robert Reyes, and he's like, what are you looking forward to most today? And I'm like, whatever's going on at 5.30 in the main room. And he's like, I heard that's because Carl Urban canceled. And I'm like... Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Damn it. Yeah, it was a bummer, but thankfully they were able to fill the spot with something cool, which was the band, because they've been practicing for a while, and they got a ton of really cool songs based on the original series episodes, as well as covers, and it's just a really fun time. They're, they also like to hang out at the Masquerade Bar, which just seems to be the place uh, where everyone sort of congregates after hours at STLV, so it's been kind of cool uh, getting to listen to their music and then hang out with them later. Yeah, you know... Um Drew uh, from Standard Orbit back in the day is a huge fan of, of Five Year Mission, and um, you know I, I I saw I didn't I didn't see their 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 set unfortunately, but as I was you know walking down the hall I saw Iris Stephen Bear coming back from their set wearing a Five Year Mission T-shirt, and I was like oh my god, and uh, I texted Drew and I told him this. And he said, I saw it on Twitter. It's like my life is complete or something. <laughs> yeah, it was really fantastic. I was told that he had visited the five-year mission booth earlier that day, and they uh, told him uh, that the band would be playing. And he said, oh, I'll wear the shirt later. And he, he he stuck true to his word. We were sitting right next to him front and center for the the show, and he was rocking out pretty, uh, pretty <laughs> intently. So it was, it was great to see them enjoying himself there. He seems like such a cool guy. You know, I mean, seeing him at these panels, you know, I, I'm sad that they did not give him his own panel because I really feel like the programming on the whole was kind of sparse in a sense, you know. There was, there was like a lot of stuff where I was like, it feels like they're they're taking, you know, a four-day programming and just stretching it out to five days instead of actually filling this stuff, you know. 
It definitely had that feel a little bit, and their programming does usually tend towards being actor centric and yeah. focusing on the performers, which is certainly cool and understandable considering the uh, financial aspect that comes with doing photo ops and autographs and the like. But um, uh, creation d- does put on a very smoothly running show for the most part. They did it as third stage this year that was curated by Roddenberry Enterprises. I don't know if that's their official taint name, but the Roddenberry group head by, headed by Rod Roddenberry, which is really cool. They had some fun programming there as well. And uh, they had Chase Masterson performing in, in the evenings doing some cabaret songs, which was pretty fun. So uh, I kind of agree that uh, they probably could have filled the schedule a little bit more. But on, on the whole, they did have a nice variety of uh, panels and things to see and do. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And and that Roddenberry stage was, was cool, and that's also where uh, Trek FM got to perform Super Bridge Mates, which was uh, exciting for, for everyone involved, which is very, very cool. Um, yeah, but, you know, I mean, it's cool, though, that, that we did still get to see people like Ira Stephen Bear and, and Ron Moore and Brandon Braga but uh, let's go back to like the first panel that that Bear was on, which was the uh, the Deep Space Nine panel with uh, a few members of the cast. It was the two Daxes and uh, Nana Visitor, and in that that panel, he talks about this documentary, which I remember him shooting back when they were celebrating the twentieth anniversary of DS Nine, which was supposed to be some sort of documentary about what DS Nine is or something like that. And I remember when I first heard about that back then, I was like, we'll never see this. Like, this is never going to see the light of day for no reason other than what's the distribution angle? How do you do that? I don't know. But uh, he, he was talking about it again today and or this weekend, and it sounds really cool. Agreed. Yeah, for us Niners, there really isn't a whole ton of material out there aside from the incredible Deep Space Nine companion in terms of uh, behind the scenes insight into the creation of the series and from from what he was saying it seems like they're really going to dig in deep and get a perspective from not only the actors but also the writers and the other behind the scenes creative types so uh, distribution notwithstanding I definitely hope uh, Ira Stephen Bear and the rest of the crew get to finish and get, get it out to the fans. Well, you know, a Trek movie did a little interview with him, and uh, the way that he was talking about it, and the, the the interview which they posted was edited, so it's kind of hard to tell. But it sounds like it's whatever the company is that does these Shatner documentaries, and apparently they're also the ones who produced for the love of Spock, because he was saying that he was hoping that it was going to be out this year, but it sounds like from that video that production was delayed because basically the Spock doc got bumped up to the to the top of the queue and he says that he's hoping that it'll be out next year um, which would be great and I mean I guess that would be the the distribution you know platform it makes sense they've got a track record of putting out Trek docs that people like to see and uh, it, would, it also makes sense that the Spock uh, documentary would take priority seeing as how it's so timely and uh, it's a pretty big uh, pretty big piece of uh, content there that people are excited about the for the love of Spock and Le- uh, Leonard Nimoy's son Adam Nimoy the director that he was in attendance as well after having shot a decent amount of the uh, footage for that documentary at the last STLV in 2015 I don't think they actually showed any new footage uh, this weekend but it is going to be released uh, later uh, this fall September 9th, the day after the 50th. There you go. Yeah, and it's going to be both uh, on VOD and in theaters. So that's that's certainly cool. And we'll definitely be covering that on this show. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, Iris Stephen Bear, he's a super cool guy. And, you know, you, they have these photo ops. And, you know, usually it is just like, you know, every actor you could possibly think of. But when I was looking at the program, I saw that, Ira Stephen Bear, there was a photo op with him, and I was like, "Oh God, you know, I'm, I, I, I've never done anything like this before because I think it's generally speaking like ridiculous, you know. Like he's he's not going to keep a, a copy of the picture, you know. I mean, it's like really kind of weird, right? But I'm like, I okay, fine, fine. This is I cannot pass this up. This is the one and only time." So I, I did it, waited in the big long line, got up there, 
took my picture with him, shook his hand, and walked away because they literally, they're, it's just like an assembly line, like, picture, all right, move on, picture, next one, you know. So I, I got the picture. Um, it looks as good as, as a picture could look. Uh, we, we, we both look really awkward, like we don't know why we're there. There's a, a light stand in, in the back behind us, which is cool, you know, whatever. Um, get to see that, uh, that, that behind-the-scenes process, I guess. And, yeah, and then today when he was signing, I went up to get him to sign it. And he's like, oh, remember back in the day when we used to stand around taking pictures together? <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, I've never done this before. This is my my one and only time, but now I'm I'm the envy of all my friends. And he signed it. He signed it DS9 rules and uh yeah, that was that. So I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> Well, he he is in fact correct. DS9 does rule. It does. And uh that's really cool. Uh I I kind of tend to agree with you. I'm not much for the photo ops myself. The only two I've actually done were unofficial. I brought my Polaroid camera, and I got Polaroids in, in previous years with both uh, Brandon Braga and Brian Fuller. So I, I kind of tend to line up with you there in terms of if I'm going to get a picture, I kind of want it with one of the writers. And yeah. um, no, it's it's cool. They they uh, creation does do a really nice job with those big glossy photos. And uh, apparently, they, like you said, they are very efficient with getting people in and out and and turning them around nicely. And I, I know people who have had the photos where they're they're blinking or it's an awkward face and and, and they'll let you do it again real quickly so uh, if uh, you guys listening are curious about what the photo ops are like I haven't done one myself but I know from other friends and past iterations of the convention that they are pretty cool it's quite possible that that photo will be the cover image for this week's <laughs> show because I've got to get my money's worth out of it you yeah, know? absolutely um, okay so uh, Another group of, of people who, who were in attendance um, from from movies past or t- television shows past were Brandon Braga, Ron Moore, and Nareen Shankar. So they had a panel together. It was like a writer's room panel kind of thing. I don't know why they didn't put Bear on there as well. That doesn't make any sense to me. But whatever. You know, it's all good. So what did you think about this panel? It's great. Uh, I'd seen Braga a couple times before, and he's always really articulate. He's one of my favorite Trek writers. Uh, I'd been hoping to see Ron Moore for a few years, but he he's always had to cancel his appearances due to his production schedule with the new show Outlander. And it was really cool seeing Narain Shankar as well. He's uh, not as well known, I would say, as as Moore and Braga, just but, but based on the volume and. Uh, and popularity of their work together, but Noreen Shankar is a really smart guy. He's done a lot of good episodes, and he also was the showrunner of CSI for many years. So that should say something about his his talent and ability as a as a producer and writer. But the guys were great. You know, they they have a great chemistry together. Any sort of beef that might have occurred in years past between Braga and Moore has certainly seemed to be. Uh, put under the bridge, water under the bridge, as, as they say, and uh, it's a great insight to just what it was like being these young guys sort of on the vanguard of modern Trek, as it were, so I, I very much enjoyed that panel for sure. Yeah, it was it was super cool, and um, I, I, you, you, you're right that you don't hear about Nareen Shankar that much, but, you know, he's, I mean, he's done the biggest show of all of them, really, That's when right. you think about it. Like, he even wrote, I think, the the episode that Tarantino directed and everything like that. And then, you know, now he's doing The Expanse, which everyone seems to love. I, I haven't seen it, but I, I, I really want to. So it was cool to see all of them up there. You know, I, I wish that they would have, you know, had more time. But, uh, you know, what can you do? So, so yeah, that, that, was, that was really cool. And, and, you know, they were signing afterwards as well. And I was able to get Ron Moore to sign my my generations laser disc which i had brandon braga sign years ago and and we shared a moment we bonded over our love for laser disc you know and he's like oh man i was just talking about this with noreen he was like you know i told you back in the day buy a laser disc player and just don't open it and i didn't listen to him and now i can't watch my laser discs <laughs> so yeah but uh so that was cool for sure and you know one one thing that we didn't talk about which we forgot did you see Rod Roddenberry and Trevor Roth at the their 
Roddenberry panel? I did see them briefly. I didn't stay here for the whole panel. Part of my game in terms of seeing panels at the convention is sort of, uh, if it's not one of the crucial ones that I want to see start to finish, I'll, I'll maybe see 20, 15, 20 minutes and bounce around and go somewhere else. So I saw them... Uh, uh, at the beginning of their panel, I'd say the first 15 or 20 minutes, and they both seem really cool. I mean, Rod Roddenberry, if you've seen his movie Trek Nation, he wasn't always a Trek fan. He sort of, you know, just based on how, how he grew up, sort of resented it and pushed away from it for a while, but now he's fully embraced it. And like we mentioned earlier, they, they sponsored a, and programmed one of the stages this year. He's the producer of the Mission Log podcast, which is really good, and um, they're both executive producers on the new show, which, of course, they were pretty coy about during the panel, but they both seem really positive and, 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 a, and a force for keeping the Roddenberry legacy alive as Star Trek enters a, a new generation, as it were. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was obviously anything that everything that everyone was asking them about was the new show and that's the one thing which they couldn't say anything about but um i don't know you know like there were a number of people who said a number of things throughout the con which i think they didn't realize they weren't necessarily supposed to say and i don't know if 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 you got this impression but i got the impression based on you know various panels that this show is almost certainly going to take place in between Enterprise and TOS. Because, I mean, in addition to what, you know, Fuller said about the registry number a few weeks back, Dorn said that it was before, that he said that it was a prequel, right? And he was up on that, that San Diego panel. Scott Bakula, who was also on that panel, said that, you know, he got to see some art and stuff like that and someone's like, uh, are you going to come back on the show or would you come back on the show? And he's like, yeah, I would totally come back. And that's actually something that we talked about. And, you know, and he even said, he's like, now don't go out and tweet this because that could mean absolutely nothing. But, you know, I talked to him about it. I'd be willing to do it. He says that he wants, you know, to do it. And, and I work for the same network. So it could very easily happen if the opportunity arose, you know? And I mean, Archer, you know, that's, I mean, that makes sense, right? If it's after his show, it would make sense. You know, you could have Admiral Archer up there doing his thing. It sounds about cool. right to me. I mean, even if this is Prime Universe, which they've gone on record saying that it is the Prime timeline, it seems that centering something either just before or just after TOS would be the most accessible for a non shrekky audience to sort of get in on if it was post Deep Space Nine Voyager, which I know a lot of people wanted to see. It, it might be a bit of a tougher sell for your general audience, but just based on the fact that TOS is still so brand recognizable, especially with the 50th anniversary and the new movie and the just the, the, the general recentness, if that's a word, and popularity of the Kelvin timeline, uh, a, a show set either just before TOS or just after, I think, would be a pretty safe bet. Yeah. I guess we'll all know by the time this comes out, actually, because they said that August 10th is, at the TCA is, is where, uh, you know, they're going to announce everything, apparently, because they didn't announce anything here. <sighs> Don't get me started on that. So, yeah. I guess this, we're, we're, this is dated now. I'm probably going to have to cut this out, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before we go, uh, Adam, where can people find you on the Internet? Find me on Twitter, D-R-0-S-I-N. Check me out, uh, co-hosting with Aaron Harvey over at Saturday Morning Trek. And check me out on the Babel Conference, just uh, scrapping around with the other Babelites, talking about Trek. All right. Well, thanks a lot for, uh, you know, joining me for this, this STLV wrap-up. And now we're going to toss it over to John and Lee to talk about some optional canon. Well, thanks, Mike, for, uh, for passing it over this way. Uh, can't wait for all of the stuff that you're going to bring back for me. Um, remember, you do have my post office box. But uh, for this side of the show, I am being joined by friend of the show and fellow podcaster Lee Hutchison. Uh, who is a host over on the Nerd Party Network. And uh, Lee, welcome aboard. Uh, welcome to Stage 9. We hope you find the accommodations comfortable. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm very touched to be on as a, as a, I love the show and I loved commentary Trek stars. So it's a, a quite a privilege to actually to be on this show. And I know that you only really hired me because I, a, I'm a Christopher Nolan fanboy and B, I'm a Paul Thomas Anderson fanboy. So <laughs> I really picked all of the the boxes for you. <laughs> well, I, I can't say that it hurt your chances of being on the show, but uh, that's that's wonderful. Uh, so we, since this is your first time on the show, we will uh, we'll go ahead and I'm going to ask you uh, what we ask everybody when it's their first time. Uh, how did you come by becoming a Star Trek fan? What was your first exposure to everything? Yeah, like when I was a kid, I it used to be on BBC Two on a kind of a Wednesday evening. So I would get home and I would watch The Next Generation and I think we were like a few years behind America. Like you can imagine anything like that nowadays. And I got really into that. And I always remember like the first Star Trek presents I ever got on a birthday. Maybe I was like eight or seven, something along those lines. I remember getting Star Trek The Final Frontier on VHS and a Dr. Soong action figure. Like if you were ever trying to like get someone into Star Trek, those were probably the most two ridiculous items ever to get. Like what's considered by the worst film by by most people. I know present company thinks differently. And an action figure of an old man. So that was kind of what got me into Star Trek and it, it kind of snowballed from there. And like one of the reasons I really like your show is that I remembered as a kid that I would watch Star Trek and you'd pick up the names, whether it was Brent Spiner or Jerry Goldsmith. And like as a kid, like you didn't really have say your Netflix and everything like that. So when you found out like from renting a video or flicking through cable and you saw like someone involved from Star Trek was going to be on it always kind of would watch that show or give it a chance or check something out if it was from a creative member of Star Trek so in a way like that's probably why I really like the show is kind of it reminds me of what I did as a kid that I always remembered when Robert Picardo's name popped up on um, Small Soldiers thinking oh my god the doctor from Star Trek is going to be in this and that that was kind of my you know experience really of being a star trek fan and like being a movie fan too excellent that's a you know it, since you mentioned brent spiner i'm gonna have to ask did you ever see old episodes of night court no i did not i don't think it ever showed here in the uk we still get judge judy but i don't think night court ever <laughs> showed here well night court was a uh, a wonderful sitcom uh john larroquette was on it um and uh Basically, it was it was a staple of 80s television in America. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure it was NBC that it was on. But Brent Spiner, uh, it took me years to realize uh, just speaking to, you know, when you have that epiphany where you say, oh, my gosh, that person's from Star Trek. It wasn't until the show was on reruns that I realized that Brent Spiner had a recurring role on it as the head of a family of uh, country bumpkins who had moved to New York City. And it was a recurring role, and he was so different from Data that it just took me years and then a repeat to realize that it was the same guy. So uh, I highly commend, uh, since we do live in the era of streaming, there's got to be some way for you to get a handle, handle on it over on the other, other side of the ocean there. Yeah, I need to definitely check that out because, like, I always remembered when he like he popped up in Independence Day that, oh yeah, like he didn't like I didn't really have the internet, and I was about ten years old, and. Like seeing him for the first time, thinking, "Oh my God, that's Data from Star Trek!" Because even then, like the kind of actors that you got from Star Trek would very rarely ever be in like proper blockbuster movies. They're more likely to be in like straight to DVD films. So to see like a Star Trek actor in like a big Hollywood film as a kid was like, "Oh my God, it's it's Brent Spiner!" It's like he's not wearing his makeup. It was it was such a buzz. Yeah, yeah, it's a that it is such a buzz. Um, and you know, since we are talking about Star Trek and we're dealing with still the uh the aftermath of the what I thought was the superlative Star Trek Beyond um, is sort of a topic that has uh, come to mind is the idea of what we'll call optional canon um, and what we're defining that as. And I want to get your thoughts on it, Lee, is that optional canon is Star Trek has a reliance maybe and does Star Trek Beyond follow in this in these footsteps of ignoring films that came previously? You mentioned that you got Final Frontier uh, on VHS when you were younger. And I would say that Final Frontier is a prime example of a Star Trek movie where the series jumped over it and it ignored that it existed. Um, do you do you support that idea? Do you do you think that that idea holds true um is it possible to watch star trek beyond with skipping into darkness or 
undiscovered country with skipping Final Frontier? Or are there other examples in the series that you can think of where they did that? Yeah, I'm, I think it's really, it's almost the kind of safe option of, I like uh, the balance of the two. That, as you were talking there, that is it possible to watch Star Trek Beyond without seeing anything before? And I've got a friend that went to see Star Trek Beyond that he put it, I've broken my Star Trek virginity. And he went to see Star Trek Beyond without any experience of the TV shows or even the past uh, two Kelvin movies. And he said that he really liked it. And this guy is like your kind of big, bald football fan sort of image. So for him to like Star Trek, that was like, wow, that's that's pretty awesome. And I think that I really like when you watch movies sometimes that sometimes like whether it's a James Bond movie and I always think of like um, For Your Eyes Only when Roger Moore puts Blofeld to his death in avenging the death of his wife in a previous James Bond movie that he was not in. And I was like, oh my God, like they're referencing the other movie. But then I can watch a James Bond movie and it makes no reference to some of the other ones that I, it's a, it really is a mixture of both. I think it's fine to reference other movies but then at other times that it's fine to go off and do your own little mission that yeah not everything connects into everything that that's maybe something that we've lost in the past few years that films are so crushed with like linking to everything and every movie before is built up to this sometimes it's nice to just have an adventure like beyond where yeah the work is actually getting to know and fall in love with these characters in the previous movie that they doesn't need to tie everything into guess what happened in the previous mission and the mission before that it's just a steady build of this character development i think yeah uh i agree i i do think the connected universe stuff has gotten um a bit too weighty uh it, it's too much of a concern if you will uh with, with modern franchises so is it possible though i mean star trek i would say the series with two, three, and four, and the intention was that five would be part of this as well. But with two, three, and four, they take place one right after another. Given the fact that we do have Final Frontier that gets ignored, we have, I mean, arguably you could say Insurrection gets ignored with Nemesis. Um, and, of course, they, re they rebooted the whole timeline because of Nemesis. Um, and then you have, I mean, Star Trek Two. you can basically ignore the motion picture. Is it possible to watch three and four without the anchor of the one that came before is you know I, I guess sort of flip side to the question do we see that star trek had a reliance for that stretch in the 80s on essentially building its connected universe just with the films but then coming through and you know breaking that trend because they i mean arguably do you think that that the motion picture is their first instance of optional canon i think it's I always think back to like when I was a kid there, like as you're talking, and I saw three before I saw two that I remembered being really unwell one weekend and my dad brought me back like a Star Trek video from the shop. Like I was into Star Trek at the time, but like we didn't have Netflix streaming. I, my pocket money was what, only like five quid a month. So it wasn't like I was going to be able to go out and buy a Star Trek videos and know everything that was going on in the Star Trek universe. So I saw Star Trek three before I saw Star Trek two. And I always remember my initial reaction was like, how did Spock get down onto this planet? Did he n knock his head and fall into a torpedo <laughs> tube? D did it, like did someone bungle him in? Like it, you know, even though there was the prologue at the beginning, it was kind of something that was a bit out of place. I, I was still trying to get my my head around it. Like he's he's, he's dead, but he's alive. Like it, you know, it was all up in my head. But I was still able to enjoy three, and I, I can't remember if I saw two before I saw four. But I think. Like you can enjoy it, but you get a lot more from it if you can connect it to the previous things that I think in my 90s mentality of growing up then that I grew up in a, you know, a world and much similar to you where very few things often tied in that, yeah, you got the Star Wars movies, which built upon the previous ones and you got Star Trek movies like two, five, uh, two, three and four, which all linked into each other. But at the same time, you still got like hundreds of TV episodes where it was that syndicated sort of feeling that if you saw an episode from season six and then the next day was season two, you weren't really missing out much. You could always dip in and enjoy it. So it was still felt like it was a treat for me when it all linked in together. But at the same time, I was still able to enjoy. And it wasn't that I felt like it was disregarding. It was just that this was just another story. And that story is just about this place and time that that felt real and organic to me that people could go have adventures and it didn't always have to tie back into something that happened three months ago because that makes a large universe like Star Trek feel really small, I think. Uh, you know, it's interesting because while you're talking about that, I'm wondering if 
part of the flaw is with the fans. Is it possible that Star Trek has always been constructed with this optional canon uh, mentality of if you don't like one of the movies, you can shrug it off? Is it possible that the fans have changed over time in that they demand things to, I mean, you know, the, the term from religion is brought in all the time of canon. And so there's always that question of, are the fans really the ones that are demanding this? Do you think that they're the ones driving it? Or do you think that, you know, for instance, Star Trek Discovery is coming out. And the big question is, where in the timeline does it sit? And one of the reasons that Enterprise, I think, had some trouble finding uh, its audience when it was on the air is because it couldn't decide whether it wanted to start new or whether it wanted to be part of this, you know, grand, you know, decades old mythology that was being built. So if you were to judge the average Star Trek fan, where do you think they land? Do you think that they can they can come into it and treat the movies as optional? Hmm, it's a it's a tough one really. I think of like a Nick Meyer comment when he was talking about writing Star Trek 2 that it's like, you know, it's that religious thing you were talking about there um, that he spoke about that you have the mass and you can't change like as a, you know, the head of the, the Catholic Church, you can't change the mass, but you can add little things to it. You can add your own little touch to, to you know, your weekly mass. And that's probably what like Star Trek is that, yeah, we've got like the staples of Star Trek. We've got these adventures in space. We've got like a staple history. But you can always add little things to it. You can always make it that bit personal that you look at Next Generation, like season three, for example, and you've got like Michael Piller coming in and Ronald D. Moore, Brandon Braga, that it was much and such the same story. As, as, it was such and much and such the same show, really, as the first two seasons. You've got it on the Enterprise. You've got all these characters. That that doesn't change, but they like start to build on things, develop things to make things more appealing to put their own little stamps on it so i always think that if you've got a, a baseline of this is your star trek history this is your star trek movies this is your star trek lore but add to it like develop it refine it and that's perhaps where enterprise really struggled because it was kind of more suffocating as opposed to building upon something and advancing forward they were kind of suffocated in by okay oh we can't really do this because in star trek the original series it has to be at this stage at this stage it's got to be there and i think canon that's when i get a bit frustrated with canon for example like i always think that tvs and movies should kind of stick to the the same history the same rules but then when with like say books and everything and it works its way backwards that you've got everything being filled in that becomes a bit frustrating whereas things like the movies and tv shows pushing forward build upon it i think that's an exciting canon and that that was that would be my kind of stance i think on it so uh i think i've dropped a couple of hints as to which ones i feel you can if you were to construct your star trek film canon where i I think i've dropped some hints about you know which ones i would possibly pick and choose which ones do you feel are the ones that you could sloth off that you could say if you were trying to bring somebody in to Star Trek, what are the key ones that you feel are the quote unquote canon? I, for instance, and I'll give an example that uh, there's a friend of mine and the way he got me into James Bond was he gave me what he felt were the four core James Bond movies aside from Skyfall that you had to see to be a fan. What are those movies in the Star Trek series and do they operate independent of the other ones? What are the one? And you don't have to limit yourself to four, obviously, because they mm-hmm. have four. Well, they, they have 13. They'll have 14 soon. What are the ones if you were to give somebody a Star Trek film gift pack? These are your canon. These are the ones you have to pay attention to. I think it's uh, it's like a tough question in a way that I wish we had an hour now to discuss this one. For me, I think the eventual goal is always to get someone to say watch all 13 movies and potentially all hundreds and hundreds of episodes that like one of the joys about the Kelvin movies is I've been able to like bring Star Trek fans along with me to watch a Star Trek movie. And like that's never happened before. Like I've always kind of tended to go myself or with one other Star Trek fan, whereas now I've been able to bring in non fans, but they've never really bothered to watch any of the previous ones. And I made suggestions, but like they're they're too busy watching say game of thrones or something to go oh, i can't be bothered to dive into this show but if they listen to me i would i would go space seed 
Then I would show them Wrath of Khan, The Search for Spock, The Voyage Home, The Undiscovered Country, First Contact, then the Star Trek 2009. And yeah, that would be like my gift pack. That's not to say I, I think anything negative of the other ones. I think that one kind of tells a kind of a story, as it were, and would whet the appetite enough to start to dive into the the other movies that I think I recently did a rewatch, like most people on the way up to beyond, and I did uh, like motion picture one night, and then I did a double bill, Space Seed, and the um, Wrath of Khan and then I went through a movie a night and then even before Best of Both Worlds I watched the TV movie version before First Contact I watched the TV version of Best of Both Worlds so I think I would kind of focus on like giving someone the enjoyable movies telling the telling the, the main story thread that runs through these movies and then have them you know dive in and watch the rest of them in their own time I think now see it's interesting to me that you you leap past uh generations uh, in that list do you feel that somebody can watch first contact like if they're going through the timeline is it possible for them to transition from uh, undiscovered country to first contact without generations being the bridge i think for me that the way i would exclude generations in this in this situation over getting them to watch it because as far as i'm aware i would say nah just fire in through 1 to 13 and you know there's some bumps in the road some potential movies will drag but stick with it i think in this scenario i think i would leave off generations in a way because i think star trek 6 brings to like ends the series so incredibly well and if we never saw spock kirk and bones ever again in any other star trek show it would just be just that little bit sweeter and i think it brings together ends the movie incredibly well and it goes like that's the end of that generation and then we can kind of leap into the other one with first contact so as much as i would want to show someone generations i feel that they could skip to first contact without seeing much of generations i think okay fair answer fair answer i i would go back and forth on it myself um i think that your your choices for film canon are strong very strong. Uh, I would actually throw Beyond in there uh, just for the sake that I f- I feel that it captures the spirit of the original show enough that, in a sense, it's it would be a nice bookend if the first film you're watching is going to be Wrath of Khan, then to bookend with Beyond would give you a really nice feel for where the crew was before, spiritually speaking, I mean, obviously the storyline is different, but sort of spiritually speaking, it would inform a bit of, you know, the Kirk and Wrath of Khan is going through the same sort of crisis of identity that the Kirk and Beyond is. And I think that those would be interesting bookends to see how the character in these two different universes encounters the same issues, but at a different point in his life. And how how do these two... I mean, beyond, if anything, is sort of the question of, you know, if he decides, if he makes a different decision before, Star, you know, between Space Seed and Star Trek 2, if he makes a different decision, how does how does that whole storyline look, you know, or even bring in the motion picture? Because that has this whole crisis of identity about was he, you know, foolish for accepting promotion and, and stuff like that, that, you know, so it's a theme that comes back with Kirk uh, sort of repeatedly. Uh, through the series for me leaving off beyond is is not so much like a canon thing that i i would 100 percent include it in there but for like threading someone through that in a way that we talk about like into darkness can almost easily be discarded that when you watch the end of 09 you think oh my god they're about to go on their five-year mission like that's always the impression you get and then it cuts like a year later and they haven't even gone on the first five-year mission and then that's the end they start the end the second movie with how the first movie ended that oh you you kind of think that's them off now so i think like ending it on 09 is more kind of appealing to someone to to tune into more that i would include beyond because it almost continues that five-year mission that thread but i would want someone to get to the end of 09 you know thrusters on full seeing that enterprise coming out of space dock and ready to warp off to new adventures and having someone go at the end of that going oh What's, what is next? Where, where do they go 
beyond this movie and i think it's more like that hook in for them as opposed to giving them everything going this is the canon leaving some of it just hidden for now hiding that adventure because i feel like if i show them all these movies and i you know i don't want to play the hand of where star trek goes beyond possibly 09 that keeping that in the air that what is beyond star trek 09 what comes next with into darkness and that will tie back in perhaps when they watch it as a full rewatch they start with say the motion picture and work their way through each one and then they get into that and it's going ah this ties into wrath of khan you know for better or worse and then they see more of the parallels perhaps with some of the older star trek movies once they've rewatched all of the previous ones with star trek beyond okay interesting that's really interesting it you know, it's uh, it's been a real treat uh, discussing the Star Trek optional canon with you, Lee. But this isn't the only thing we've been talking about here on Trek FM this past week. Here's a quick look at some other things you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek.FM, The Ready Room. Please sit down. Let me get my eel. <laughs> yeah, right. It just slapped. See, now that would have been <laughs> awesome if he had just like slapped the eel in Archer's face and then Archer that entire meaningful scene at the end of the episode the discussion <laughs> between Archer and T'Pol if he had had a giant eel stuck like, to that the, great. the whole time. time the orb and what's so great I think about Star Trek Deep Space Nine is especially with Cisco is you get to watch somebody slowly become a believer in a faith and it, it it's shown as being reasonable literary treks the big difference is uh, when you're doing nonfiction books, when we, the way we do them, we do a lot of interviewing, and the interviewing requires a lot of transcribing tapes, and that's possibly the most miserable job one could ever run into. It's a real task. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out these shows and find out what we're talking about in your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond you'll find us wherever you get your podcasts if you're an apple user be sure to hit the subscribe button as that helps us out greatly and makes it easier for other listeners to find the show as they search itunes if you're not an apple user we've got you covered as well you can find our shows on stitcher TuneIn, soundcloud windows phone and of course you can stream and download the mp3 file from our website and grab the rss link as well as always, we would like to thank the Stage 9 associate producers, Jeff Sutter and Chris Steftenagel. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for your support of Stage 9 and the network. And if you would like to support the network as Jeff and Chris have chosen to do, you can uh, keep all of our shows coming to you by becoming a patron of the network on Patreon. If you visit patreon.com slash trekfm, you'll find our current goals and different milestone contribution levels along with all the great perks we have for you these perks include early access to content exclusive content producer credits seats on our content development team and more we really appreciate any support you can give us and we hope you'll join the team again you'll find the details at patreon.com slash trek fm and of course you can contact us on twitter at trek fm you can find us on facebook at facebook.com slash trek fm and you can find the Babel Conference, which is our listener forum uh, on Facebook. Just type the Babel Conference, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook or go to our website at Trek FM and click discussion on the menu bar. So, Lee, where can people find you on the Internet if they want to talk about... Uh Star Trek optional canon and beyond. You can find me on Twitter at Lee underscore Nostromo and we've discussed Star Trek Beyond and not necessarily the canon on my a podcast I co-host with my ma uh, mates Tristan and Matt, The Senate Floor, which you can find wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, great. And uh, of course, you can always find me at Kessel Junkie crawling around the internet. You can find me over on Aggressive Negotiations, a Star Wars podcast with Trek FM's own Matthew Rushing on the Nerd Party Network. And you can find me over on Words with Nerds with my pal Craig. So once again, thanks, Lee, for joining us. And uh, be sure to tune in next week as Mike and I are reunited and we share some of Mike's reflections from Star Trek Las Vegas. Thank you.